Well, everybody got a cocktail? Everybody ready for three more short talks? All right. Well, it is my pleasure to bring up our next speaker, someone who is not a stranger to the Odd Salon stage, and someone who uh, over the last year has become known as the uh, biggest word nerd in our little nerd herd. So, my pleasure. Please welcome Brianne Hughes. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Brianne, and today I am here to talk to you about the history of the forbidden fruit. Now, this subject could just be a casual stroll down the produce aisle, but for me, this subject touches on a much bigger question, much bigger question, why does anything ever happen? Why does anything ever happen? <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the universe is governed the universe is governed by physical laws, but when we dig down into these Odd Salon stories, it often seems like it's just one random coincidence after another. Being in the right place at the right time seems to be the only key to success. Happenstance seems to shape future standards more than intentional choices. And random chance pops up all the time in word histories, too. Uh, a good example of this is the origin of the most famous word on the planet, OK. Uh, the word OK was just one of a handful of whimsical, misspelled acronyms that American newspapers were having fun with in 1839. KG for no go, NC for enough said, OK for all correct. It was just this, it was a flash in the pan of word fun, but it happened to be that the very next year, Martin Van Buren ran for re-election. And he was from Kinderhook, New York, so his nickname was Old Kinderhook, and a group that supported him was called the OK Club. So this random wordplay acronym suddenly became part of the national conversation in an election year, and it was the only one from that group to stick around, and it's probably now the most commonly written and spoken word on the planet, just for no reason, just random things <laughs> happening. So why, why do we currently consider the apple to be the forbidden fruit from the Bible? Is that random chance? Did one piece of culture skyrocket to stardom, or has it gone in and out of fashion? Well, let's go back to the beginning. Um, I'm going to give some. <laughs> I'm going to give some biblical context here um, because I don't presume to know your odd background. And chances are that you did not go to Catholic school for middle school and high school and college, <laughs> like I did. <laughs> but I did. I was a. I went to an all-girls Catholic high school. Um, and this academic background is helpful because there are a lot of historical facts about the Bible that the general population is just not aware of. Um, I also want to share this. I want to share this knowledge with you um, because my mother is here tonight in the audience, who, who, who paid for my lovely schooling. <laughs> Thank you, mom. And so, even though she rightly calls me her heathen child, um, I, I did receive a, a fine education, and it's nice to give her some proof of that sometimes. Um, so, <laughs> the Bible is a real historical book, <laughs> um, written in uh, Biblical Hebrew and Aramaic. Um, it was uh, written by many writers who each had a specific audience that they wanted to educate or persuade, and then all of these books were compiled together. Um, the Bible is Old and New Testament, about 66 books total. Um, we're just talking Old Testament today, so no Jesus. Um, <laughs> The Bible is made of many sources, even within the same books. Um, these four uh, represent the current theory about the authorship for the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. So you may ask, how do we know that there are several sources shoved into the same books? Well, a very good example is in Genesis. Uh, in the very beginning of this very big book, there are two creation stories about humanity back to back. Uh, so let's do a little Genesis recap for my fellow heathens using the King James Version. So Genesis 1, first six days, God makes all the things, including men and women together on the sixth day in the image of God. Genesis 2, uh, God rests on the seventh day. Then God forms a man out of the dust, just Adam. Adam names all the things, but he's sad and lonely. So God puts him to sleep and pulls out a rib to make Eve. Uh, they're naked together in a garden paradise with one rule, don't eat from a specific tree. So myth one is God makes all the people at the same time. Myth two, God makes Adam, then makes Eve from Adam. That's two creation myths. Those are not the same. Those don't go together. Those are two things. 
Um, we, we go forward to the rest of Genesis here. We have Genesis 3, we, the actual Pandora's box event, uh, where the devil appears as a serpent, persuades Eve to bite the apple. She very generously shares it with Adam. Um, and they don't like being naked anymore. They make fig aprons, and then God kicks them out of paradise, and now childbirth hurts. Um, okay. Um, the Bible goes on to describe wholesome topics like fratricide, mass extinction, rainbow promises, and slavery, and that's just the rest of Genesis. Um, this image is actually keywords from Game of Thrones, but you can't tell the difference. So, <laughs> um, there's a reason why the Bible is the best-selling book of all time. It's pretty messed up. So, that's your Genesis recap. So, in Genesis, what word do they use to describe the fruit of the tree of knowledge? Uh, Peri, Hebrew for fruit. Uh, this word is used many more times in the Bible to describe both literal and metaphorical fruit, as in the fruit of the trees, fruit of your labors, blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Um, and because no fruit is explicitly named in the Bible, rabbinical scholars and academics of all sorts have propo proposed an amazing cornucopia of possible interpretations of what the fruit is. Um, like fig, because after they eat the apple, they're explicitly said to have put on fig leaves. Um, other ones include pomegranates, citron, wheat, quince. People say maybe grape or apple because they can be turned into alcohol, and that's a way to learn things. Odd salon, right? Um, or even mushrooms, because that's a mind-altering drug. So, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure that there are issues in rabbinical scholarship in Judaism, but I just really love it as this respectable, built-in tradition of critical thinking and close reading for a religious text, um, looking for small changes that could open up this massive text after thousands of years in a new way. It's cool. And um, I don't expect to do another odd, uh, Old Testament talk for a while, so I have to tell you the best biblical scholarship thing I've ever learned. The second creation myth, when God pulls the rib out of Adam, the writers didn't actually mean rib. They probably meant penis bone. Why? <laughs> One, a creation story should explain something, but men do not have fewer ribs than women, so that doesn't tell us anything. But human men do not have penis bones, but many animals do, so this does explain something. Secondly, ribs are not... <laughs> Ribs are not symbolically related to creation anywhere else, but genitals are. And third, at the end, God closes up the flesh where he took out the rib, but there's no scar in the rib area, so it's another bad creation myth. Um, but the term flesh is used elsewhere in the Bible to mean penis, like this passage about prostitution in Egypt. So um, close reading and critical commentary like this can help illuminate a lot of dark corners of biblical text. But in the case of petty and the forbidden fruit, we don't get a straight answer, no one's reached a consensus. So we know it's a fruit, we don't know which one or if they just meant it metaphorically. Let's look at some other influential moments in the history of forbidden fruit. So in the late uh, 300s, Jerome, Mr. at the time, Saint now, translated the Bible into Latin. So he had to decide which word he was gonna use for the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Uh, he could have used the Latin fructus, but instead he does a very clever thing. <laughs> You see, in Latin, there are long and short vowels. Malum means fruit or apple, and malum means evil. So Jerome makes a clever pun that reinforces that bad, Eve made a bad choice and sort of starts us down an apple-y path. <laughs> All right, thing two, let's look at some naked people. Um, figuring out the, the fruit intended by the artist in biblical art is tricky for a number of reasons. Um, one is their naked bodies, not as fun as Pompeii, but... Um, <laughs> The problem is that apples have been around for a really long time, but they used to be smaller and looked a lot like, like crab apples. So it's hard to tell in these paintings what fruit they wanted you to think they had. Um, also, a lot of people use this subject of the Garden of Eden to work on their mastery of anatomy or to explore themes of sin, like Bosch here. They don't really care about the fruit. Um, it looks like Bosch went for cactus. <laughs> um, so. Um, and like Michelangelo, they say it's a fig, but it's an Eve's closed hand on the top of a chapel. So I feel like he wasn't really trying to make a statement about which fruit uh, in this particular piece. Um, but we do have an influential piece of art by uh, Durer, um, who we talked about previously because of this rhino. Uh, in 1504, he painted Adam and Eve in a very Germanic forest, and he used apples. Um, it's black and white, and it's small, but um, that's apples. <laughs> um, 
And this influenced other people to make things that are apples. Again, I don't know if these are apples, but that is what art history is telling me. So um, that's what, <laughs> so Dura did this thing somewhat influential. Um, we come to uh, another influential creation, uh, often seen at Odd Salon, most recently at Occult, and then in Steen's Invocation at Mutiny, Paradise Lost, a big poem about the heavenly battle between God and the devil. Uh, it invented and popularized a lot of Bible-adjacent imagery. Uh, in Paradise Lost, Milton calls the fruit of the tree of knowledge fruit, but also apple. Um, this illustration looks like spicy pears, I don't know. Um, okay, so maybe another one for apples, but my word senses are tingling. Let's learn something new. Plot twist, apple meant both generic fruit and specifically apple up through the 1700s. Words change meaning all the time, and apple was used interchangeably with fruit throughout the, uh, through up into the 1700s. So Milton maybe wasn't saying it's a red delicious, but in hindsight, later generations are interpreting that way because to them, apple can just mean apple and not fruit. But this nice, leads nicely to our next point, which is that every fruit has and will be an apple. Um, <laughs> apples are botanically native to Central Asia, and although they've changed shape as we genetically modify them, they've been the fruit for a very long time. So every fruit up here has been called an apple at some stage. Um, crab apple, pineapple, pomegranate, French has pomme de terre, earth apple, cucumbers were called earth apples in Old English, dates were finger apples, bananas were apples of paradise, tomatoes were also apples of paradise. <laughs> um, so apples the fruit by which you judge all other fruit. So it makes sense that the forbidden fruit of the Bible would be considered again and again to be this purest defining member of the fruit category for Western Europe. Um, there's one more thing before the Bible came about, which is that Greek culture existed, and apples were already forbidden and stolen in Greek myths. Um, Heracles had to steal a golden apple as one of his labors, and uh, Paris chose to give the apple of discord to Aphrodite. That's what started the Trojan War. So we have another thing that's sort of pointing us towards apples as being precious and important and thievable. So we add all of these bits of history up, and what we get is a fully blossoming tree of apples. Sources from visual arts, literature, and culture have intertwined or independently come to the same conclusion for Western Europe, that it's most easily understood as an apple. The Bible left it open for interpretation, and these crisp, juicy cultural seeds have been accumulating for the last 2,000 years. So I want to make a toast to random coincidences and inevitable fates. Let's not be afraid to use our sinful knowledge to explore the roots of history, accept what we find, and take a juicy bite out of life. L'chaim. Right, Thank you, Brienne. Now, if this is a familiar face to you, it might be because this is her third Odd Salon talk. And for the new folks who don't understand why everyone else is freaking out, that makes her eligible for the fellowship. And so, I feel like I should get on one knee or something, but these are gonna rip. So, if you will have us, would you like to join the Odd Salon Fellowship? I do. She said yes! All right, so. Come on out to Oddments next month where all the new fellows will get pinned. It gets out of hand. You're going to love it. Thank you, Brian. All right. So one of the many things I love about Odd Salon is that someone can stand up here and throw out a word like coprophagia. And about a third of the crowd like me is like, I don't know what that means, but I'm game. The other third is sort of putting the pieces of the word together and saying, oh, okay. And then I think there's another third that knows exactly what it is, but they're like, I don't want to admit something like that so readily. 